Hi everybody, I hope this video finds you well. In today's video, we're going to be finishing up chapter 6 by taking a look at section 6.4 and learning a couple additional properties and ideas related to linear transformations. To start off with, we're going to talk about the definition of the composition of linear transformations. This is going to be very similar to the idea of composition of functions, so let's jump right in and talk about this definition. So T1 is going to be a linear transformation that goes from vector space V into vector space W. And T2 is going to be a linear transformation that goes from vector space W into vector space U. Then we can define the composition of these linear transformations as T2 composed with T1. We still use that open circle notation to represent a composition. And that will be a linear transformation defined as T2 composed with T1. It'll start from V, go into W, and then go into U. So it'll actually be a linear transformation from V into U defined as, well, T2 composed with T1 of V is equal to T2 of T1 of V. So you take V, any vector in vector space V, pop it into the first transformation, get the result, and that'll be in W, and then you can pop that into T2 and get your resulting vector in the vector space U. Once again, this is a little bit weird because we have a definition and it says that we need to prove something. What we're going to prove is that T2 composed with T1 still retains its linear properties, that it'll still be a linear transformation. So what we need to do is we need to show that T2 composed with T1 will be a linear transformation. It is certainly a well-defined mapping according to this, but we do need to make sure that it is still a linear mapping, a linear transformation. So let's let V1 and V2 be elements of V. First thing we need to show is that T2 composed with T1 of V1 plus V2 is equal to T2 composed with T1 of V1 plus T2 composed with T1 of V2. <clears throat> so we need to show that this composition distributes over vector addition. So we'll work from left-hand side to right-hand side. So let's go ahead and do that. By definition, this composition is equal to T2 of t1 of v1 plus v2 but then keep in mind t1 is by itself a linear transformation so we know t1 distributes over that vector addition so this is t2 of t1 of v1 plus t1 of v2 and then of course we know t2 is by itself a linear transformation so this distributes over this vector addition so this would be t2 of t1 of v1 plus T2 of T1 of V2. And then, of course, well, this right here is the definition of the composition. This is the definition of the composition. So this is T2 of T1 of V1 plus T2 of T1 of V2. And we've shown it. We've shown that if each individual transformation is a linear transformation, then the composition will be a linear transformation. All right, we've got to show that it also distributes over scalar multiplication. So now let's let V be an element of V and K a scalar. So now we need to show uh, that T2 composed with T1 of KV is going to be equal to K T2 composed with T1 of V. In other words, we need to show that the composition of these two linear transformations will distribute through the scalar multiplication. So I'll, again, we'll work left-hand side to right-hand side. So T2 composed with T1 of KV. That, by definition, is T2 of T1 of KV. We know that T1 is a linear transformation, so it'll distribute past that scalar multiplication. So T2 KT1 of V. And we know T2 is also a linear transformation, so it'll distribute past that K. And we will get k t2 of t1 of v. And of course, well, t2 of t1 of v, that's the definition of the composition. So this is k t2 composed with t1 of v. And that's exactly what we wanted to show. So t2 composed with t1 is a linear transformation. So this does finish our proof that if you start with two linear transformations and you compose them together, you are guaranteed to get a linear transformation. So this tells us that now when we have linear transformations, we can work with them just like we work with functions. And if you go from V into W and then you have something that goes W into U, you can put those transformations together and get something that goes from V into U. Let's just look at a quick example of making sure we understand this, giving ourselves an actual couple transformations to work with.
So let's let T1 be this transformation that goes from the polynomials of degree two or less into the two by two square matrices. This uh, is gonna be defined as T1 of a polynomial is the matrix P of zero, P of one, P of minus one, P of zero. And then we're gonna let T2 be the linear transformation that goes from the two by two matrices into the real numbers defined by when you take T2 of a matrix, you get the trace of that matrix. So let's first just calculate uh, the composition of a given vector here. So let's go ahead and for A, all we wanna do is we wanna evaluate T2 of T1 of x squared minus three x plus five. And according to that, that's gonna be T2 of T1 of x squared minus three x plus five. So what does T1 do? Well, it takes an A polynomial and spits out a two by two matrix. And thus, this should be T2 of, T1 of this is gonna be the matrix P of zero, P of one, P of minus one, P of zero. So P of zero is going to be five. So one, one is gonna be five there. P of one is gonna be one minus three, which is negative two plus five, which is three. P of negative one is going to be one plus three plus five. So that sounds like nine. And then P of zero, which we already calculated, should come out as five. So T1 of this polynomial results in this two by two square matrix. Then T2 is supposed to take the trace of that. So that would turn into five plus five, the sum of the diagonal elements, and that would be equal to 10. So overall, this polynomial, once you feed it through T1 and then feed the result through T2, will result in something that goes into R, which is just the real numbers, and this polynomial will go to the real number 10. So notice that when we did this composition, we went from P2 into the matrices, and then from the matrices into the real numbers. Overall, this resulted in something that started from a polynomial and ended in R. That's what the composition does here. Now, let's also try to go ahead and connect this to a topic that we were doing in the previous video, which is the idea of the kernel. So let's see if we can come up with the kernel of the composition and state the dimension of that kernel. All right, so for B, we want to figure out the kernel of T2 composed with T1. So this right here, uh, it's going to be the kernel of this transformation. So it's going to be a subspace of P2. It's going to be all the things that from P2 get mapped into the zero vector in R. So let's go ahead and look at that. So P of X is an element of the kernel of T2 of T1 implies that T2 of T1 of that polynomial is supposed to result in zero. And when I say zero, I actually mean the zero vector in R, which of course is just zero. So what is T2 of T1 of P of X? Well, this would tell us uh, that this is T2. T1 of P of X would create this matrix here. So we'd get the square matrix. P of zero, P of one, P of negative one, P of zero. And of course, to be in the kernel, this would need to equal zero. And then of course, uh, when we get this here, uh, we'd sum that up according to the trace. So we get uh, P sub zero plus P sub zero is supposed to equal zero. So I guess we get two P of zero is supposed to be zero. So P of zero is supposed to be zero. So for P of X to be in the kernel, P of zero needs to be zero. Now, of course, P of X in general is an element of P2 of R, which implies that P of X looks like AX squared plus BX plus C. But we just learned that P of zero must be zero. So what does that tell us? Well, P of zero equals zero implies that, well, zero has to be equal to A times zero squared plus B times zero plus C, which would imply that C needs to be equal to zero. So the only restriction to get something to be in the kernel of this is that C must be equal to zero. So the kernel of T2 composed with T1 would be all the polynomials of the form AX squared plus BX plus zero. So there is our kernel. It's all the things that have a zero constant component, but of course are in that space of degree two or less polynomials. 
All right, so what's a basis for this? Well, if we want a basis for the kernel of T2 composed with T1, should be pretty easy to see. We can let A be one and B be zero, so we get X squared, and then B equal to one and A equal to zero gives us X. So anything that can be generated out of X squared and X alone, right? So any linear combination of X squared and X is gonna give us something that looks like this, which is guaranteed to be in the kernel. That tells us that the dimension of the kernel of uh, the composition here is going to be equal to two since we had two basis elements. If you want to, you could also use this along with the general rank nullity theorem that since we had a kernel that is dimension two and since our starting space is dimension three, that means the range must be dimension one. Since our codomain of the composition is R, which is also dimension one, that actually tells you that the range is everything in R. So the range in this case would be everything in R. Okay, so this gives you guys a small example of just working with the composition. Uh, now that we sort of have that, we'd like to talk a little bit more about some descriptors for different linear transformations. And again, these are gonna be sort of related to concepts that you guys have learned about functions. Namely, we're gonna talk about what it means to be onto and one-to-one. -one. So let's go ahead and talk about those. So our first definition is we're going to talk about what it means to be a one-to-one -one linear transformation. Now, you guys know uh, probably from your work on functions when you were first taking algebra or calculus what it means for a function to be one-to-one. -one. Remember, actually, for a function to be one-to-one, -one, that's sort of what establishes that a function can have an inverse. And it's very similar for linear transformations. So a linear transformation from V into W is said to be one-to-one -one if T of V1 equaling T of V2 implies that v1 equals v2. In other words, what this is saying is that a linear transformation is said to be one-to-one -one if that if you end up in the same spot after your transformation, that means you started from the same spot in your domain. So the only way you can end up in the same spot in your codomain is if you came from the same spot in your domain. In other words, every element gets mapped to a unique destination in the codomain. Remember, to be a mapping, to be any sort of transformation at all, linear or nonlinear, every element in the domain can only go to one thing in the codomain. That's just a basic rule for transformations, functions, mappings, whatever. What this is saying is that everything not only goes to one place in the codomain, but every vector goes to its own unique destination in the codomain. An older term for one-to-one -one is called injective. You might see that referenced in some of the textbooks or online. So just know that one-to-one -one is the same as being injective. <clears throat> now, this is the formal definition of what it means to be one-to-one, -one, but there's actually a nice way of understanding one-to-one -one based on the kernel. We're not gonna prove this, we're just gonna give this as a proposition, but a linear transformation is one-to-one -one if and only if the kernel of that transformation is only equal to the zero vector. So in other words, you can check that a linear transformation is one to n, one to one by checking this straight definition, or you know, usually a little bit easier, you can sort of look at the kernel and confirm that the kernel only consists of the zero vector. And that guarantees that the transformation will be one to one. All right, similar to one to one, uh, you can sort of see one to one is something that sort of talks about making sure that each uh, vector has a unique destination in the codomain. Now we're going to give a definition for making for something that we've sort of encountered several times, which is when the range actually is the same as the codomain. And that is what we call onto. So definition, a linear transformation from T from V into W is said to be onto if for every vector in your codomain, there exists some vector in your domain such that that vector gets mapped to W. In other words, being onto basically means that everything in W gets hit under this transformation. An older piece of terminology, instead of saying onto, some people like to call it surjective as opposed to injective, which corresponds to one-to-one. -one. So again, onto and surjective just mean the same thing. Uh, there is a nice way of understanding onto based on what we've been discussing from earlier videos. A linear transformation is onto if and only if the range of the transformation is exactly the same as the codomain. So being onto, again, you can check this sort of straight definition, 
Or if you prefer, you can directly show that the range of the transformation is identical to the codomain. And this proposition definitely doesn't even require a proof because this is literally what it means to be onto. It means everything that you create through your transformation, that's the range, exactly matches everything in the codomain. Okay, one last definition before we look at an example here. We have a very special term uh, for things that are both one-to-one -one and onto. So if you have a linear transformation that is both one-to-one -one and onto, so it has both those injective and surjective properties, then we call that an isomorphism. And if there is an isomorphism, then we say V and W are then said to be isomorphic. So if you have an isomorphism, so a transformation that is both one-to-one -one and onto, then you call that transformation an isomorphism and you call the spaces isomorphic. Now, a couple little notes here, not that we're gonna go too far into this, but just as a little note, if T is isomorphic or an isomorphism, then T inverse, the inverse transformation will exist. And that T inverse will actually go from W into V with the property that T inverse of T of V is guaranteed to be V and T of T inverse of W is equal to W for all V in V, W in W. So when you have uh, this concept of isomorphism is actually identical to the concept of an invertible function. Now, we're not going to really study uh, inverses of linear transformations. It's just not really something that we need to go too far in depth in. Your book briefly mentions this. I just wanted to give you guys this as a note. If you have both these properties of being one-to-one -one and onto, then those are the two properties necessary to make sure that you actually have an inverse transformation. And that inverse transformation would basically just reverse your original transformation. So notice that the domain of the inverse is the same as the codomain of the original transformation. The codomain of the inverse is the same as the original domain of the transformation. And this property basically says that it maps things back to where you started. So again, this is more just for your guys' benefit to sort of see this, that the ideas of one-to-one -one and onto combine together to basically make the inverse possible, but it's not gonna be something we're gonna to investigate too much. Instead, to sort of wrap up this section, I wanna go ahead and take a look at one example of actually showing something is an isomorphism and then connecting these concepts of one-to-one, -one, onto, and isomorphisms with a general rank nullity theorem to really strengthen that importance of dimension. So let's go ahead and look at those quick examples. So we're gonna look at this example here. We're gonna consider the linear transformation that goes from P2 of R into R3 defined by T of P of X is P of negative one, P of zero, P of one. We're going to try to show that T is an isomorphism. So to show T is an isomorphism, what we need to show is we need to show T is both one to one and onto. And to do that, what we will do is to understand one-to-one, -one, we will understand the kernel of this transformation. Then, once we understand the kernel, we can use the general rank nullity to understand the range. And once we understand the range, we should be able to show that it's onto. Now, before we get into that, let's talk about how we're going to determine the kernel. Well, we have this nice definition, but notice we could actually write a slightly alternate definition. So, since t of p of x is equal to p of minus 1 comma p of 0 comma p of 1, right? We could also say, well, what is p of x really? Well, p of x is coming from p2 of r, so we could actually say that this is ax squared plus bx plus c. And, well, what would p of minus 1 be? Under this notation, it looks like it would come out as a minus b plus c. p of 0 would give us c and then p of one would give us a plus b plus c. So an alternate way of understanding this transformation is you could do it this way, which is sort of more functional notation, or we could do it this way, which sort of shows us exactly what happens to a generic element. I prefer this way for calculating the kernel. Let's go ahead and figure out that kernel then. 
So P of X is an element of the kernel of T implies that T of P of X needs to be the zero vector in our codomain, which means that it needs to be zero, 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 right? Because the zero vector in our codomain is zero, zero, zero. So according to this right here, what that basically tells us is a minus b plus c comma c comma a plus b plus c needs to be 0, 0, 0. Notice that this gives us a system of equations. a minus b plus c equals 0, c equals 0, and a plus b plus c equals 0. If you want, you can translate that into a system of equations, 1 minus 1 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 1, 1, 1, 0. And of course, again, as always, whenever you're working with the kernel, you're, if you do translate it into a system of linear equations, it will be a homogeneous system. All right, now we can do a little bit of fanciness, right? We can go ahead and do R3 and replace it with R3 minus R1. So 1 minus 1, 1, 0. 0, 0, 1, 0, and then you know, we should get 0, uh, 1 minus negative 1, so 2, 0, and 0. And then, just to make it really clear, let's interchange R2 and R3, and we should get 1 minus 1, 1, 0, 0, 2, 0, 0, and 0, 0, 1, 0. Well, what do we notice about this? This guy has rank 1, 2, 3, so it's got rank 3, there are three uh, variables or three uh, columns here. So this will have a unique solution. And since it's homogeneous, that unique solution is all zeros. So this has unique solution, A equals B equals C equals zero. Now, of course, was this really necessary? You probably could have just figured out that A equals B equals C equals zero from here. If you know C equals zero, then you know a minus b is 0, a plus b is 0, and you could just solve it directly. But again, never hurts to just do it through the matrices. So a equals b equals c equals 0. So that tells us that the kernel of t, the only thing that's in the kernel of t, is the polynomial ax squared plus bx plus c, where a, b, c all equal 0. So the only thing in the kernel is 0 x squared plus 0 x plus 0. So this implies t is 1 to 1. So we've shown the first half of what we needed to show to show that it's an isomorphism. Remember, our goal is to show that it was an isomorphism. We've just shown that the kernel only has the zero vector from our domain, so that guarantees that it is 1 to 1. Now, is there going to be a lot of work to show that it's onto? Well, it turns out the general rank nullity theorem makes this very easy. So general rank nullity shows us that the dimension of the range of t is going to be the dimension of our domain. Remember, our domain is p2. So the dimension of p2 of r minus the dimension of the kernel. That's the general rank nullity. So that then tells us that the dimension of the range, the dimension of p2 is 3. The dimension of the kernel, well, the kernel only has the zero vector for P2 of R, so it has dimension zero. Remember, if you only have the zero vector in your subspace, you're considered to have dimension zero. So that tells us that the dimension of the range of T equals three. Okay, so that tells us that the dimension of the range is three. But remember, the range is a subspace of R3. R3 only has dimension three. So since the range is the same dimension as the codomain, that means the range is the codomain. So since range of t is a subspace, subspace you can write sort of like that. It almost looks like a less than or equals to, but you sort of curve it to represent that it's a set. So the range of t is a subspace of R3, which has dimension 3, which implies that the range of t equals R3. Well, what does it mean when the range equals the codomain? That means it's onto. So we've just shown directly that it's one to one. Now we know it's onto. So T is an isomorphism.
So we've shown that it is one to one and onto. That is what you need to show to show something is an isomorphism. Now, this is really sort of important because if you look back, the only reason that T had a shot at being an isomorphism is because these guys had the same dimension. Because keep in mind, what do you need to have happen to be an isomorphism? First, you have to be one to one, which means your kernel has to have dimension zero. So if your kernel is gonna have dimension zero, then your range by the general rank nullity is guaranteed to be the same as the dimension of your domain. But you also, for something to be an isomorphism, need the range to match the codomain. Well, that means that the range is going to have the same dimension as the codomain, and the only way that that's going to work if things are already one-to-one -one, is if these two spaces have the same dimension. So a sort of important side fact from this example is the only way you can find an isomorphism is if you're going from one space into another that have the same dimension. Now, if you have that, it is not guaranteed to be an isomorphism, but that's a necessary condition. So if you ever see a transformation from one space into another where the dimensions don't match, it is impossible to find an isomorphism. Okay, now, on that sort of similar logic to what we just described there, we're going to do one last example of proving some statements about one-to-one, -one, onto, isomorphisms, etc., all based around the general rank nullity. And this is really to hopefully help you guys understand the importance of understanding dimension and also understanding that general rank nullity. So we'll wrap up chapter six with this last example here. So we're going to try to prove these five statements, and we're going to see that all of these can be proved in some fashion by manipulations of the general rank nullity. So for this first one, we'd like to prove that if you have a transformation, notice it could be any transformation from P3 of R into M2 by 3 of R, it cannot be onto. In other words, there is no way to make a transformation where you start from P3 and you hit everything in M2, 3 of R. You should think that this sort of makes sense because P3 of R, dimension-wise, is smaller than M2, 3 of R. And that's the argument we're going to use. So let's go ahead and see, all right? Let's first make a note for A, the dimension of P3 of R is equal to four. The dimension of M2 by three of R is equal to six, okay? Now, by general rank nullity, we know that the dimension of the range of T is going to be the dimension of the domain in this guy, which is P3 of R minus the dimension of the kernel of T. Now, the only thing we know is that the dimension of P3 is four. So we know that the dimension of the range of T is gonna be four minus the dimension of the kernel of T. Now, I don't know what the dimension of the kernel of T is because I don't even know what this transformation is. But I know that the smallest this can be, I mean, the dimensions are never negative. So what this tells me is that the dimension of the range of t must be less than or equal to four. The biggest it could be is four if the dimension of the kernel is zero, otherwise it's going to be less than four. So the dimension of the range is less than or equal to four. But we know that the dimension of the codomain is six. So the dimension of the range of t is going to be strictly less than the dimension of m23 of r, which implies not onto. Because what does it mean to be onto? It means that the range is the same as the codomain, which is impossible because we just showed there that the dimension of the range will be less than the dimension of the codomain. So what you guys have just shown there is you've just seen that there is no way, no matter what transformation you come up with, that you can go from P3 of R and hit everything in M2 by 3 of R. Okay, let's try another one. Now we're gonna show in B that you cannot come up with a transformation that goes from R5 and ends up in P2 of R that is one-to-one. -one. So we're going to show that it cannot be one-to-one. -one. All right, so let's go ahead and do that. Let's start again with our sort of note. Let's just make sure we know the dimensions of each of these. Dimension of R5 is five, and the dimension of P2 of R, well, we know that that is three. All right, so let's again go by general rank nullity. 
right? Let's phrase it in our standard way. Dimension range of T is the dimension of our domain, which in this case is going to be that R5. So the dimension of R5 minus the dimension of the kernel of T. Now, in B, I'm talking about one-to-one. -one. And remember, one-to-one -one corresponds to the kernel being dimension zero. So let's rephrase this in terms of the kernel. So what I'm gonna do is bring this over here and this guy over here. So this tells me that the dimension of the kernel of T is going to be five, which is the dimension of R5, minus the dimension of the range of T. Okay. All right, but now remember, the range of T is a subspace of P2 of R. So the range of T can be no larger than P2 of R because the range of T lives inside the codomain. So we want to note the dimension of the range of T must be less than or equal to the dimension of P2 of R, which is equal to 3. So the biggest that this could be is 3. So the smallest the dimension of the kernel could be is 5 minus 3. So what we've just realized is that the dimension of the kernel of t must be greater than or equal to 2. Right? If the dimension of the range is 3, then the dimension of the kernel will be 2. If the dimension of the range is less than 3, like 2 or 1, then the dimension of the kernel will be bigger than 2. So the dimension of kernel is greater than or equal to 2. Why do we care about that? Well, if the dimension of the kernel is greater than or equal to 2, that tells us the dimension of the kernel of t is not equal to 0, which implies not 1 to 1. All right. This is a clever use of the general rank nullity. But let's think about what it's really saying. It's saying it's not one to one. Why is that? Well, there's too much stuff in our domain. There's five dimensions worth and we're trying to squish it into three dimensions. There will be no way to do that uniquely. So it cannot be one to one. All right, let's go ahead and try the other one. So we'll just move on to our next page. Let's go ahead and take a look at C here. So we know that we have the dimension of the kernel being three and we're going from M3 of R into P5. Then we're trying to show that T is guaranteed to be on to. So let's go ahead and do that, right? Let's just make a note again. Talk about the dimensions of our spaces. Dimension of our domain, M3 of R, is going to be nine, three times three. And the dimension of P5 of R, of course, is six. So general rank nullity tells us that the dimension of the range of T which of course is again what I'm interested in because I'm trying to show that it's onto. So let's talk about the range. Is gonna be the dimension of our domain, M3 of R, minus the dimension of the kernel. Now this time it's actually gonna be a little bit easier. I actually know both of these. So I know the dimension of the range of T is gonna be nine minus the dimension of the kernel, which we are given is three. So that tells me that the dimension of the range of t is 6. But the range of t lives inside the codomain, which is p5 of r, which has the same dimension. So since range of t lives inside p5 of r and same dimension, this implies range of t equals p5 of r, which implies that it's on to. In other words, that our range matches our codomain equally, right, exactly, and therefore it is an on to transformation. All right, now we've got D here. We'd like to actually show that if the dimension of the kernel is zero, then T from R4 into M2 of R is actually an isomorphism. So for D, we need to try to show T is an isomorphism, so we need to show that it's both one to one and on to. We actually get one for free, knowing that the dimension of the kernel is zero immediately tells us that it is one to one. So dimension of kernel of t equals zero implies kernel of t is just the zero vector, which implies t is one to one. So we get the first part of isomorphism very easily. Now we need to show that it's onto, and that'll guarantee that it's actually an isomorphism. So we'll again make our little note here. 
in this transformation, note the dimension of our domain, which is R4, is 4. The dimension of M2 of R is also 4. Notice that that's what we were sort of mentioning in the previous example. If there's any hope for an isomorphism, the dimensions have to be the same. Now we can do the general rank nullity. We can say that the dimension of the range of the transformation is the dimension of the domain, which is R4, minus the dimension of the kernel. Well, that tells us that the dimension of the range is 4 minus the dimension of the kernel, which we're assuming is 0. So that tells us that the dimension of the range is 4. But we know that the range lives inside the codomain, which also has dimension 4. So since range of t lives inside m2 of r with same dimension, this implies that the range of t equals m2 of r, which implies that t is on to. So we got for free that it was one to one. We just showed that it's on to. So t is an isomorphism. Check. OK. Well, we've only got one last one to do here. We're going to show that if you're going from the m4 by 2 into p2 of r, then the dimension of the kernel is guaranteed to be greater than or equal to 5. So we've got one last one here. Let's go ahead and take a look at that. Same idea. Let's start with our sort of note. Dimension of the domain, m4 by 2 of r. Well, that's going to be 8. The dimension of p2 of r, that's going to be 3. So let's do our general rank nullity. The dimension of the range of t is equal to the dimension of the domain, which in this case is the 4 by 2, minus the dimension of the kernel. Clearly, we're trying to prove a statement about the dimension of the kernel. So let's rearrange again, bring this guy over, bring this guy over. So this tells us that the dimension of the kernel of t is 8 minus the dimension of of the range of t. Okay, well, dimension of the range of t, remember range of t is a subspace of p2 of r. Its maximum dimension is 3. So, since range of t is a subspace of p2 of r, this implies that the dimension of the range of t is less than or equal to 3. At most, it can be 3. Well, if this guy is less than or equal to 3, then 8 minus that is either going to be 5 or higher. So dimension of the kernel of t has to be greater than or equal to 5. And that's exactly what we wanted to prove. In other words, what this is basically saying is you have 8 dimensions worth of stuff here. You only have 3 dimensions that you're heading into. That means you need to use at least 5 dimensions worth for your kernel to map to the zero vector just to fit this stuff in here. Now, you could even waste more. You could have a dimension of the kernel being six or seven or even eight if it was just the zero transformation. But you know you need at least five dimensions worth being mapped to zero just to make that eight dimensions fit into the three that are available. So this really does bring the sort of conclusion to you guys of this discussion of dimensions and linear transformations. Really, the idea here is that dimension is sort of this restriction about how much flexibility you have in these spaces. And these transformations basically have to abide or follow that restriction on the space. So now we sort of know that when you have a large space going into a small one, it's impossible for that to be done uniquely, meaning it's impossible for it to be one-to-one. -one. If you have a smaller dimensional space going into a larger dimensional space, it's impossible to cover everything. It's impossible to be onto. So this really tells us that that concept of dimension helps us understand vector spaces completely, not just by themselves, but even when we're transforming from one space to another.